By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And welcome back to the Paladins of the North Cup. We have reached the semi-finals and in the semi-finals we are going to look at Dion's deck to the core we already saw that one in the quarterfinals and he is taking on Baptiste a player from Belgium who is playing white blue lion dip so this is going to be exciting now before I start with the deck decks I would just like to point out that as always if you want to go straight to the games I know some of you do please check the timestamps below. They're in the description of the video. You find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games. If you click on there, it will take you straight to the action. It's kind of the easiest way to scroll through the video. You can also use it to go to a specific deck tech if you want to. You can also, of course, use the description to find out what the rule set is of this tournament. I can also tell you it is Swedish. That means no mana burn and no fallen empires in this specific format. Okay, now that that is out of the way, we are going to start with the deck decks. And I'm actually going to start with the deck of Dion to the core. Let's have a look. And here we see the deck of Dion. So I've called it to the core because this is alpha beta only. And you probably recognize this deck photo from the last episode because Dion was featured in that episode. So I'm just going to keep the deck deck brief because of that. So if you want to see a more extensive deck deck, I recommend uh, you to go to the video uh, of the last Timmy Talks episode because there you can see a more extensive deck deck of this specific deck. So it's white, it's blue, and it's red. It's got all the power in there. It's got some of the best restricted cards in there as well in the form of Balance, Demonic Tutor, um, Mind Twist. So I guess it's also a little bit of black, right? You have that standard black splash of Demonic Tutor and Mind Twist. I think what makes this deck so good is the combination of just that ramping up with the, with the Mox and the Lotus in combination with a pretty solid creature base, a quick creature base, right? You've got Setchtrol and Savannah Lines. Those are creatures that give you a lot of value for the amount of mana that you pay for them, and they'll probably enable uh, D to deal a lot of damage early in the game. Once he's dealt some damage early on, he can finish the job with his direct damage package. There are four Lightning Bolts and four Psy Blasts in this deck, so I think that's what makes it really strong. And of course, the Disenchants are great in this build as well, because you need a weapon against the Mistress Factories, and Disenchants will do the job for you. Okay, so uh, this is the deck of D. Like I said, I'm just going to keep it really, really brief because I've already discussed it in the previous episode. So check that one if you want a more extensive deck deck. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Line Dip. And here we see the Line Dip deck of Baptiste. And this is really your traditional Line Dip build, right? We are seeing some variations of the Line Dip where, for example, people add red for some direct damage. This deck doesn't have that. It's really the traditional focus on the colors white and blue, really that control shell with those aggro creatures, Savannah Lines and Surrender Perfeed. And of course, you know, the usual Black Splash, Demonic Tutor and Mind Twist. It makes perfect sense to splash these two cards because they're so powerful and in their casting cost, there's only one black. So it's quite easy to find that one black mana, especially in old school where you have access to City of Brass, the Moxon and the Black Lotus. If you have those cards, then it's quite easy to splash in those two cards. I actually wish from a card design point of view, they would have made the cards two black and X. I think the cards would have still been very powerful, but not as easy to splash into every single deck. Same thing goes, in my humble opinion, for Ancestral Recall, just make it two blue, you know, it would still be great, but at least you would have to commit a little bit more to the color and making it a little bit more interesting, right? Because now it's just so easy to splash those cards. Same thing goes for balance. Anyway, but that's a different discussion. Um, if we look at this deck, the line dip, what makes line dip so good is just a really basic idea, right? You play out your Savannah Lines turn one, and then the rest uh, of the game, you're protecting your Savannah Lines with your counter spells. You use your swords to plowshares and possibly your Psy Blast to kill the creatures of your opponent. You use your distant chance against the factories, and you can just keep dealing damage with your Savannah Line. It's really a control game. Um, if you can ramp up, maybe you can even get a Surrender Befreed out early and kind of use the same strategy. Later in the game, you've got your two Sarah Angels. So in a nutshell, that's what you want to do. Now, the difficult thing with this deck is because it's not an easy deck to play if you want to win a whole tournament with it. You know, let me put it that way. If you want to get far, it's difficult. If you take this to a tournament, I'm sure you'll, you know, you'll win three out of the five matches if you kind of play okay, you know. Uh, if you have all these beautiful cards, by the way. But if you really want to win a tournament, you got to play really solid. Because what's difficult here is that a Swords to Plowshares, a Disenchant, they're all one-to-one -one trades, 
right? It's not like you're doing a two for one. So just one to one trade. So you really got to time your cards properly. You got to know when to play your creature, how to defend your creature, when to counter a certain spell, how to sideboard against what deck. And then there are a few cards that can kind of tilt the game for you. Cards like Brain Geyser, uh, a well-timed counter spell, a uh, card like Mind Twist, card like Balance. Those are kind of cards that can shift the balance in a game. But before that happens, you just want to make sure that you control the game. And, you know, white and blue is just great if you want to control the game. And I believe Baptiste is a great control player. He also made it to the top eight, I think, of a, of a Raging Bull series. I think it was last year, Baptiste, but correct me if I'm wrong with that. Anyway, um, this is the list of Baptiste. We've seen the list of Dion. That means we're ready for the semifinals. Let's go. Game number one, here we go. We have D sitting on the right with his to the core deck. And on the left, we have Baptiste with his line dip. Looks like D has taken a mulligan here, putting a card on the bottom. So London mulligan rule, meaning if you don't want to keep your first seven, you can uh, reshuffle, draw seven again, and then because it's your first mulligan, you put one card on the bottom if you choose to keep, and so forth. So for your second mulligan, you put two cards on the bottom. Um, anyway, we see a good start of both players here. Uh, D starting with a Mox Emerald in a Plateau, and uh, we see Baptiste here starting with a Mox as well, but it's quickly disenchanted by D. Ooh, there we see an Ancestral Recall in the upkeep of D. This is a very good move, a very good start by Baptiste. And I think that was just a pass by D, so he couldn't find a land. That is bad news for D, especially after that uh, Ancestral Recall by Baptiste. So, Baptiste is really, uh, it's really looking good for him. And there's an island, I believe, that he's gonna play. Exactly. Does he have a Mox? I believe he's got eight cards at the moment. Yeah, he's pointing at the Recall, explaining that he's gotta make a decision what to discard. Maybe it's nice to um, note here that for the top eight, there is no time limit. For all the other rounds, there's a 50 minutes time limit. And, and that may sound like a lot, 50 minutes, but especially for specific decks, it's hardly enough time. I do think it's good there is a time limit, by the way, because these events already take an entire day. And it would simply take too long without a time limit. But for this semi-finals, there is no time limit. So Baptiste can take all the time he wants to decide what card he wants to discard. Would have been nice if we could see his hand. And okay, so he's discarding a Sarah Angel and passing the turn. Let's hope for D that he can find a land or a Mox. Oh, there's just a pass. This is so bad. This is so bad. There is a strip mine. Is he gonna strip the plateau? That would probably be a good move. Maybe he's got better options though, but ooh, passing turn. I would be tempted here to strip the plateau also because it's the, the white source and the red source, so he can play lightning bolts and disenchants with that. Obviously, I don't know what's in hand there of Baptiste, so I'm sure he's made this, uh, he's seen this option as well and decided not to. I mean, maybe he's low on land, so also that could be the case as well. Discarding is also low on land, interesting. Wow, what an interesting first game here of the semifinals. Both players just drawing and discarding and going. Not finding enough lands. Okay, ooh, there's a Loa, this is huge. This is huge, seven in hand, of course. He can pass in end step, he can start drawing some extra cards, or, or now already, actually. There is a Savannah line, I'm just expecting maybe a lower draw and then uh, a potential swords here on the line. Yeah, exactly. You know when your opponent has so many cards in hand, it's so likely that they have an answer. And D is not surprised at all. I think for D, this is now really a losing game because of that Loa. Look at that. He's starting to find Lance as well. Basu turns seven in hand. I mean, this is just really easy going for Baptiste. I'm sure his hand is full of counter magic as well. Discarding a Brain Geyser there. Really a non game, unfortunately, here in game number one of the semifinals. 
I mean, we've seen Dee's deck perform doing really well at this tournament, so we know what he can do. But if you, if you don't find lands, it's just tough. Remember, he already took a mulligan uh, to six. Probably kept a hand with the Mux Emerald and the Plateau, hoping to find some more mana along the way. And there we see a Surrendip Afrit. So the 3-4 powerhouse from Arabian Nights. And now Baptiste can start swinging in. Okay, at least he's finding a Mox. So this gives him access to a Side Blast. Which you can use to kill the Afrit here. But I'm expecting Baptiste to have a counter spell if he does it. Then again, you know, he could, he could try. If he counters, he counters, whatever. I think we're going to see... Yep. Oh, no! <laughs> oh, I thought it was a... Side Blast, it's not a Side Blast, it's a Set Troll, it's just a 2-2 because D doesn't control any Swamps at the moment. And there we see Baptiste, of course, drawing a card on the end step here of D. Thinking what he wants to do. Does he want to spend the Swords on the Set? He does, interesting. Because it's not really that big of a deal, right? You could just consider keeping it on the field, it's just a 2-2. Some extra life here. And Baptiste drawing another card. Oh, so many cards for him. Remember, he also played that Ancestral Recall earlier in the game. That active Loa, I mean. If this was timed, I'm pretty sure D would have said, you know what, you have this game. <laughs> well, let's start game two. And of course, Baptiste just took uh, damage from his Surrender of Freed, by the way. I mean, he can just animate the factory, swing in for five, right? Put him on... Uh, I believe he's on 24 right now, so he can just then uh, put him on 19. There we see another factory, so he can even then pump the factory. Interestingly enough, he's not animating the factory. Does that mean that he's got, for example, a Sarah Angel in hand. And it looks like D took three life from the set troll, so I think that's wrong. I think he should have taken two. It doesn't really matter that much. It's a small mistake. It, it means he's on 22 still, in this case. And we're going to see another surrender, I believe. So some more pressure on the board here from Baptiste. And that makes sense. He wants to keep two blue open for a counter spell. The thing is, when you're when you're this far ahead as Baptiste, you start to think, okay, I really don't want to lose this game anymore. And that's what he's really focused on. So sometimes that leads to even playing slower because you're so far ahead, you don't want to give it away. So you start to rethink everything. And remember, he's got a full grip of cards as well, so he probably has tons of options. And D, unfortunately, has very little options, not because of cards in hand, but because of mana, available mana. Look at that, only those two beautiful Moxen. I just kind of feel bad for D here. I mean, semifinals, he played so well, and then he's here game one, just not finding any lands, even after the first mulligan. There's really nothing you can do. going through the motion, but if there's no land or mox there, there's probably little that he can play out. Is he going to play an Ancestral Recall? Probably going to play into a counter spell, but I mean, he can try. If you're Baptiste, you could even consider letting him draw the three, because that means he's going to go up to nine, and he's got to discard anyway. On the other hand, you don't want him to find a land. If he's got a land, he might find a way to get back into it. I mean, a balance would be really good for D. If he can, if he can like, with this Ancestral Recall, find a white source, and then maybe find a right moment to cast a balance, you know, it could work. There's the white source. Okay, we've got a Mox Pearl. I'm expecting to see at least a Swords here. Oh, Savannah Lines. I was really expecting a Swords. Not so impressive. I would just let this slide if I was Baptiste. And there's no threat for uh, 
the line is no threat. And he can just untap and, uh, and deal at least six points of damage through the air, potentially also attack with his factories. We do see his swords there in hand. I, I think I wouldn't play the swords also because you want to keep your Loa active, right? So he's first going to take two damage from the dips, drop to 17, probably draw card number seven. I wonder if he's going to animate the factory. I mean, it's very tempting because D doesn't have enough mana. You know, he doesn't have a red source or a white source to, to potentially kill the factory. He only has that Mox Emerald, so it's quite easy for him is to animate at least one of the factories, attack with a 2-2, can possibly pump it to a 3-3, deal some extra damage. He's choosing another line of play though, dealing 6 damage here to D, he's gonna drop to 16. Then he's gonna play out the land. And he probably has 7 in hand now. This is quite interesting, I wonder if he wants to play out something else, because or else I would have probably attacked with the factory as well. It kind of seems like a free attack. Maybe he wants to be able to play out two counter spells, which could be a reason. With the mana he's got to open out, at least he can counter and, and swords and, you know, he's just keeping all his options open, which is something a control player loves to do. If they Usually when a control player has to choose between keeping all options open or dealing some extra points of damage, they usually choose the first option because they just want to want to make sure they're prepared for whatever is going to happen. We also see a Mox Ruby there in his hand. Of course, he's not going to play that out now because that means he would go to six in hand and he wants to keep the Loa active. There is a pass turn. Can D find at least some more lands? Or a balance, but I think I'm casting a balance right now just would be asking for a counter spell. There is another mock, so he only needs the mox ruby to complete his set. And I think he would have much rather wanted the mox ruby here. Red being a big part of his deck. Black gives him access to demonic tutor and mind twist. Obviously, two very powerful cards, but yeah, does he have them? I think, I think if you're D here and you would have, for example, the Tutor in hand, I would just play it out and let Baptiste counter it. Because Baptiste is not going to tap out. He's not that kind of player. He's not going to do that. So maybe you can trade for some counter spells. He's playing four counter spells, I believe, in a mana drain. So you can try to take some counter spells out of his hand. There's just a pass here. And of course, there's that Loa activation going to eight. And then there's some action in the upkeep, it seems. So are we gonna see a Psy Blast? Yeah, there's a Psy Blast on one of the Afrites. Are we gonna see a counter spell? That's basically the question here. No, we're not. And Baptiste being very disciplined here in deciding what he wants to counter and what he doesn't want to counter. It's probably your gut instinct here to say, okay, he wants to kill my flyer, I'm gonna protect my flyer with the counter spell. But I think if you're Baptiste, you've got this in your mind, you know, okay, these cards I wanna counter, balance of course being one of them. And yeah, this swords on my one creature, it's not a big problem. I still have got a flyer, I've got my two factories, I'm fine. So he's gonna fly over the line again, deal three points of damage, D dropping to 11. Going through his cards again. Playing out the Mox Ruby that we saw earlier, just probably just to keep seven in hand. And the Mox can kind of help him. And he's still not using the mazes to attack, which I guess makes a little bit more sense now because D's got that one Mox Pro open. Tapping. Ooh. What is he gonna do here? Are we gonna see a Brain Geyser for four, for five even? A Mind Twist, ooh, even better. A Mind Twist here, taking care of the hand of D. And uh, that's a Mind Twist for six. Yeah, I mean, it was already game, but now it's game game. <laughs> I mean, the only, basically the only thing that, that Baptiste has done here, by the way, which is interesting, he's made Balance a better card because of this Mind Twist. 
The problem, of course, for D here is that Baptiste is too good of a player to, you know, he's always going to have a counter spell up at this point in the game for that potential balance. So, yeah, there's, there's no way he can get through this. I mean, a time twister, perhaps. Again, the problem is, how is D going to get the opportunity to actually not to play these cards without them being countered? That's what I'm trying to say. There we finally see an attack by the factory. And remember, he's got that other factory open to pump it to a 3-3. So there we see a block. Then we're probably going to see the pump. That's it. Going to take three more damage. Going to drop to eight. And I guess that's a pass here. Or does he want to do something still in his second main? I mean, Loa stepped anyway, so if he's got seven, he might as well go to six. Oh, he's got a discard. Interesting. And look at that. He's choosing to discard over playing it out. And that is because he wants to. Oh, D very happy. <laughs> Finally finding a land. Congratulations, D. You found a land in game one. That is great. Your second land of the game. It's just ridiculously bad luck for D here. But what I wanted to say is um, uh, Baptiste choosing to discard a creature over playing it out because he wants to keep two counter spells open. He's like super cautious uh, with his game plan. And there we see, are we going to see an animation? We do. So we're going to see an attack here. He could actually... No, he couldn't kill him, and he misses one life point, so this makes sense. This is better. So he attacks for five. He could potentially bump it to a 3-3, three, three, the factory, dealing six points of damage. And D just taking the damage here, no pump. Which is interesting, I think, because if you pump it, he goes to two, which means one attack with the factory would be enough to kill him. There is a disenchant there on the Mox Pearl, and I, I think this is a very good move. That's it. Yeah, I mean, it was game a long time ago, but I do understand Baptiste, though. You want to make sure that you make no mistakes. I mean, it has happened uh, to me a lot of times where I was really, really ahead, and then my opponent topped a balance, played it out, and I'm like, oh, man, why did I tap out for my air elemental? That's so stupid. So I really do understand um, that uh, that the players are taking their time here. Remember, this is the semifinals. The winner of this is going to continue to the finals, which is a pretty big deal. Anyway, both players are going to go and sideboard, and we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two, here we go. Oh, and do I spot a Loa in the hand of Baptiste? Oh, that is brutal for D. He's got a nice opening, by the way. Turn one Savannah Alliance. That's basically what he wants to do. Put some extra pressure on. But there's that Library of Alexandria. We already saw that in game one. And now in game two again. Oh, man. Like, it's good news for you, Baptiste. But, uh, yeah. I'm always hoping for exciting games. And I think this is going to be one of those control games. Unless, of course, um, D can get rid of it. Maybe find... A Chaos Orb, or of course a Strip Mine in hand, that would be ideal. Remember, he also plays, of course, with Demonic Tutor, so, you know, that can also be a road to the Strip Mine. Playing out of Volcanic Island for now, and uh, dealing two points of damage with the Savannah Alliance. Baptiste on 18, and okay, there's a balance. Okay, that's something. I believe he's got five in hand now. So at least it kind of turns off the Loa for a while. I think this is a good move. Bupti's drawing another card, of course, to get some more card selection. So he's got eight in hand, so he's got to discard three. Dion, of course, losing a land as well to his own balance and that lion. So he is, he is paying a hefty price. But it's, it's just to get... Baptiste away here from the uh, from the Library of Alexandria, and Baptiste now is going to make a tough choice. 
What five cards does he want to keep? What I usually do is just to start thinking, okay, what cards do I want to keep instead of what cards do I want to discard? I think there's a recall there in his hand. He could choose to discard that, although it could be super good later in the game. And this is just really tough for D again, because yes, he, he's got the balance, so Baptiste's going to go back to five as well, but he's going to draw into card number seven. He could just pass and, and basically skip a turn. And, and you know, D is losing a land and a Savannah Lines, which is not great for him either. It's really nice when you can play balance when you have some Moxon on the board, because balance doesn't count artifacts which is a great way to kind of go down in hand size and have some extra mana on the board as well and then for forces your opponent to discard even more cards. So I guess these are the cards that Baptiste wants to keep. So he selected four cards. Okay, these are the cards that he wants to discard. Black Lotus, Blue Elemental Blast, Sarah Angel, and a Plains. There's the untap. I wonder if he's going to do something. No, he's just going to pass, right? Exactly, because he's going to go up to seven anyway. There's a scrubland. If he's got a demonic tutor, that would be ideal. Mox Pearl. That's it. Oh, man. A set stroll would have been quite nice here, by the way. So now he's up to seven passing turn. And I think Loa's active now. If, if Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he's on six. We'll, we'll just have to see if he's going to tap the Loa. We know he's on seven. I believe he is right now. And that means that D is basically back to square one. He does have more land, more mana available. Can he take use of that? That is a big question here. If I have a Sedge, I would now play it out. You know, I would take the risk. Okay, now he would play it out, definitely. But it looks like he doesn't. I mean, it's hard to see his hand. Maybe there's a Sarah Angel in there. Could be. Tapping four. Okay. Armageddon. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Playing an Armageddon to get rid of one low. I mean, the price that D is paying here to get out of that Loa situation. First the balance, now the Armageddon. It's brutal. I mean, this is huge card advantage for Baptiste. I understand, I understand, you know, but I, I'm sure this was a hard decision for D to make. It's kind of like a catch-22. Of course you gotta get rid of the Loa, but at what price? There is a Mistress Factory. Are we gonna see some Mox in here as well? Yes, there's a Mox Pearl in the pass. What an interesting game so far. There's a Tundra. Only two cards in hand for D remain. I mean, he needs he needs like the power cards. He needs like Ancestral Recall or... Okay, there's Disenchant. I think that's a good move. There is a Tundra and an attack. So that means D's on 18. And there's a land that's not too shabby. What card is that in hand of D? Only one card remains. That's a Lightning Bolt. And this is actually pretty good for D because he's killing a creature and taking care of a land. There's a Savannah Lion, so a new problem. Yeah, and the card advantage for Baptiste is huge again. We saw that in game one. We're seeing that in game number two also. And that is, of course, the big problem. That means that if you're uh, D and you want to get back into this, you basically need the Ancestral Recall. There's a Strip Mine. I wonder if Baptiste is going to use it. It must be tempting here. Yeah, going, going for the blue source probably because of that Ancestral Recall. And there's a Swords. 
Obviously, the deck of, of D has a lot of answers, but what he needs right now are cards. He just needs more cards. Already played out his balance. There we see a City of Brass in the past, so at least not a Surrender Pafrit or anything. So that gives him a little bit of breathing space. There's a line I'm expecting uh, to be killed. It's not happening yet. So three lands for Baptiste and a full grip of cards. And only one card on the side of D and a Savannah lines. Looks like he's going to play something out. Taking a damage from his own City of Brass. Dropping back to 19. Demonic Tutor. Ooh. That's bad news. So Demonic could simply go into Ancestral Recall because he can play it out as well. Obviously it also depends what he has in hand. Shuffling up here. And they're putting the cards back. And he's passing turn. There we see D taking on his turn. No ancestral recall and upkeep here. I guess that makes sense if you're Baptiste, you want to keep that uh, potential white mana open, right? For maybe a Swords here on the Lions. Or maybe not. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there's a Swords. So that means D is going to go up to 18. And that's it for him. Nothing he can do. And I mean, it's looking so good for Baptiste. And if you looked up the Ancestral Recall, it's going to look even better for him. Is he going to cast it now? Yeah, he's going to cast it. Yeah, that's. Nothing D can do here, no blue mana open for a potential counter. So all he can do is sit back and watch uh, Baptiste draw even more cards. Tapping, playing a Savannah line here. Finding a Mistress Factory in the pass. So putting some pressure on the board here. Okay, this is something a bad lands for D. Tapping. Are we going to see a Satch Troll here? There is a Satch Troll. Can it stick? <laughs> Cannot. Blue Elemental Blast from the sideboard. Taking care of the Satch. There is a Mox Jet. An attack here for four. So pretty aggressive. Another Lion. And remember, he now still has two blue open. Only three cards in hand for Baptiste at the moment. And uh, he's going for the aggro plan here. He can attack for six this turn. Animating, that's exactly what he does. Attacking for six. No bolts, no swords on the side of D. All he can do is just take the damage, going to eight. And Baptiste is so close to the finals right now. Remember, he's already a game up. That's six more damage. There's a disenchant at least. Taking care of the factory, but he's still going to drop to four. So he only has this one turn. Needs to find something against one of the lions. Finding a land. Okay, at least that's something. Oh, counterspell. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Wow, that Counterspell was good. Counterspell on the Ancestral Recall, that was really, really necessary. And I have to say, Baptiste, I mean, you're playing really well, obviously, but also your draws were phenomenal. And uh, winning this 2-0, I think, D, there was really nothing else you could have done here. Um, but we know now who one of our finalists is, and that is Baptiste from Belgium. And the other finalist is Mari from the Netherlands. And here we can see his deck. And guess what? It's also line dip. So we're going to get a line dip mirror match in the finals. And here you can see both of the decks. And Mari sure loves his altars. There's some really cool ones uh, in, his, uh, in his deck. Well, if you want to see the finals, make sure to tune in for the next episode. Because then I will bring you the finals, the uh, epic end match of this tournament here in Groningen, the Paladins of the North Cup 2022. Who will win it? Is it going to be Mari with Line Dip or is it going to be 
<laughs> uh, Baptiste with line dip. So it's the Netherlands versus Belgium in the finals. Now, before you go, I would just like to ask you to do three things to support the channel. Uh, first off, if you don't want to miss this finals, subscribe and ring that bell to make sure that you don't miss the finals and you get uh, notified when it goes online. Um, then the three things that you can do is you can um, leave a like, so hit that thumbs up button, it really means a lot. The other thing you can do is leave a comment, so let me know uh, what you think about these series, this video or whatever's on your mind. Please share it in the comments below and also you can share this content on your socials. All these three things are completely free and they really help Timmy Talks grow and take the channel to the next level. So I would really appreciate it if you could take a moment to do these things. And there's one last thing you can do and that is you can become a sponsor of the show. Here you can see the Timmy Talks Patreon page and uh, that's actually how you can sponsor the show. You can become a patron. There's probably an info card popping up right now. Click on that info card and that will take you straight to the Timmy Talks Patreon page and there you can uh, you can support my channel, the content that I make and help me continue doing what I'm doing. It already starts with just one dollar a month um, so yeah please consider becoming a patron there are some nice perks when you do you get access to the Timmy Talks discord um, you get access to the Timmy Talks online tournaments the events that I organize and also your name will be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every video including this one so um, yeah what are we waiting for let's go to the end scroll and take a look at our fantastic wunderbar amazing patrons and channel members of Timmy Talks here we go Thank you to Samba Kazee!